Hey, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? All right, awesome. Uh, sorry for the date change on here. It uh, says May 19th. I gave a similar talk at the uh, FSISAC summit on the Cyber Threat Alliance. Um, in this talk, I'll give you an updated version of this, uh, so don't worry. Um, I'm a little bit out of it. I just actually landed like an hour ago, <laughs> coming from the East Coast. Uh, missed a flight last night, so it's been a rough morning. But I'll, uh, I promise you, I'll, I'll warm up as we go. Um, if you have any questions at any time, please let me know. And uh, more importantly, I'll try to end a little early so we can uh, talk one-on-one -on -one afterwards as well. Um, so my name is Vishal Harry Prasad. I go by V8. A um, little bit about me. I uh, came to Palo Alto Networks about two years ago. Um, I had started a company called Morta Security, which uh, was acquired. It was the first acquisition by Palo Alto Networks. Um, and previous to that, I actually have a government background. I was uh, did my undergrad at the U.S. Air Force Academy. I was a cyber warfare officer for the U.S. Air Force for quite a long time. Uh, my last station was at uh, Fort Meade in Maryland at the NSA. And that's where I got a lot of my experience um, on various roles of uh, cyber attack, exploitation, and defense. Um, used that to help create the company that was then, uh, that brought me to Palo Alto. Okay, so that's um, my place now. My new job there is uh, Architect of Threat Intelligence for Unit 42, which is our threat intelligence team. And uh, at the end of this little uh, talk about the Cyber Threat Alliance, I'll uh, use a use case from some of the publications that we do to kind of put it all in perspective, the um, importance of information sharing um, and what it can or cannot do for you, okay? So with that, the uh, Cyber Threat Alliance, um, I'm gonna go through probably about 20 minutes worth of uh, talk on what the Cyber Threat Alliance is um, and what it's not. Um, and more importantly, uh, especially for this audience, how you can potentially emulate a similar uh, construct um, for relatively low to no cost. Um, the Cyber Threat Alliance has been around for about two years now, and um, all, everything we do is it's um, inter-vendor. There's no uh, sales, there's no anything associated with uh, any of the research or the uh, work that we do, okay? Um, so I'll talk about the roadmap, uh, I'll talk about some lessons learned from our first attempt at uh, information sharing, and then I'll talk about uh, the, our move to Sticks and Taxi and that platform, okay? Um, and then after all that, I'll open a new presentation and talk about why you should use Sticks and Taxi or how you potentially could use Sticks and Taxi. All right, so the Cyber Threat Alliance, um, it was founded, again, at the end of 2013. Um, and to 2014 to 2015, it's been growing uh, at a significant rate. But originally, it started with four founding members, which is uh, Fortinet, uh, McAfee, which is now Intel Security, uh, Symantec, and Palo Alto Networks. Um, traditionally, we are all... Uh, not adversaries, but we're competitors in the security vendor space. Um, and so the idea here was, let's, uh, let's get together and pool, pool our threat intelligence teams, our uh, great researchers from all these companies. We all see different uh, aspects of the cyber underground or the adversary space from around the world um, at different levels of the security stack. So I mean, with, uh, especially with Intel and Symantec, they're well known for their endpoint uh, solutions and enterprise solutions and home. Um, Fortinet and Palo Alto, primarily in the data center, uh, the internals of a company, as well as the perimeter. So at the network level, all the way up to the application layer. Um, we have a pretty good view of, or uh, sample space um, coming from all these vendors. Um, we've since added uh, eight more contributing members. This includes uh, tele telecommunications providers like um, Telefonica, um, Barracuda Networks, um, uh, Avira, Sophos, Onlabs, um, and a few others. And so it's going to continue to grow at a pretty, pretty uh, fast rate. Um, the key idea that was behind the thesis for the Cyber Threat Alliance was that it doesn't matter about our products. Our products will speak for themselves and we'll let the respective uh, sales folks do their job and let the clients decide for themselves. The goal of the Cyber Threat Alliance was to pool our understanding of the adversary and try to come together and get on the same page when it comes to how these, uh, how the cyber underground actually works and our understanding of it from each of our respective uh, viewpoints. One interesting thing that you'll see here, and it'll be announced publicly uh, towards the end of the month, uh, well, the end of next month in October, um, is a major, our first major white paper release, which is going to be pretty significant, it's going to be very large, um, over 40, 50 pages uh, with a lot of interesting uh, data that came from all four companies. Um, and reveal some pretty interesting things on ransomware, um, specifically our ability to go into, from a non-government perspective, uh, the back ends of how these guys are operating. Okay. Um, so, purpose again was to come together and uh, 
put, put, put aside our competitive uh, differences and see what we can do to improve information sharing and more importantly, threat intelligence about advanced adversaries. Um, it's open to any organization that can meet the minimum standards. So I'm about to show you the minimum standard chart on the next page. Uh, don't tune it out just because it's, it's very high standards. It's meant for the security industry um, primarily or folks that are, or companies that are heavily involved in security research. Um, doesn't mean that you cannot uh, benefit from the uh, results of the Cyber Threat Alliance as well as uh, not just the pure uh, samples or the pure raw intel, but also just the way in which we do things as well. Everything that we do is open sourced um, to the maximum extent possible, including the software and platforms that we use. Okay. Um, so the minimum standards, just so you understand the people that are uh, involved here, uh, every day on a daily basis, every member both uh, founding and contributing, has to submit at least 1,000 new uh, portable executable samples per day, um, which is, by new, we mean it hasn't been seen by virus total or on the open source community within the past 48 hours. Okay, so that's um, roughly about 10 to 12,000 new uh, PE samples per day. Um, on top of that, uh, that's the minimum. Um, you, every member also has to submit 50 mobile malware uh, samples, whether that's Android or uh, iOS. Um, and it also, they could either do that or submit um, 100 botnet, live botnet C2 uh, servers or um, 100 attack sites, drive-by download sites that are new as well for and this is on a daily basis. So the scale uh, is, is very large, and as we grow, it grows exponentially. We'll talk about some of the challenges for that. But the view that we have um, as the Cyber Threat Alliance is, right now there's a lot of, um, a lot of different organizations out there, including various ISACs, which we are a part of, uh, quite a few of them. Um, and there's a lot of uh, emergency response teams out there as well, um, all with uh, various company socks sitting between the two, trying to gather information from, the, from both of them. What's interesting is, given the fact that we are uh, security industry standard, we kind of sit between the entire uh, grouping in that all of those socks uh, at one layer or another, more than likely we'll have one of our product lines, um, which is really interesting, really kind of a cool thing. We have a very large visibility. Out of band, outside of the, um, the actual uh, products, we have the informal information sharing relationships with uh, a few ISACs, including the FS ISAC, um, and as, as well as a few of the certs, including DHS. Um, and that's going to continue to expand as we grow as an organization. So we kind of see ourselves um, as a cross-vendor, cross uh vendor neutral cross um, information security space uh, from a threat intelligence standpoint. And I say we, I talk as if I'm part of the Cyber Threat Alliance. There's actually no full-time members in the Cyber Threat Alliance. It's all borrowed folks. I'm actually a full-time employee for Palo Alto Networks. Um, but I spend, you know, I, I go down there once a quarter to Symantec's headquarters, uh, spend time in their offices with their threat intel analysts, and vice versa. It's uh, pretty cool. Um, it's, it's interesting to see that outside of the product space, we're doing a lot of really cool things. These are all just the threat intel people, the geeks like myself, that really just care about finding cool stuff um, regarding the threats, okay? So it's, it's, it's one interesting thing to note when you're looking at the reports and some of the information that will be provided by the Cyber Threat Alliance here relatively soon. Now, we're going to talk about uh, the roadmap, and I'll talk about Sticks, Taxi, and Cybox here uh, in a little bit. But the roadmap for the Cyber Threat Alliance in the past two years, we started out really early, just like any other organization. We, had, we established our bylaws and our um, minimum sharing requirements that I shared with you. Um, and then we started the malware sharing process, which was just, let's jump into this full bore. We don't, um, we didn't define too much other than a thousand samples. We didn't say what kind they were, um, if they had to be associated with a specific adversary, anything like that. It was just share a thousand new samples a day. We'll go from there. Um, it's one of those things where the Alliance will continue to um, modify itself and grow, learn as we go. Um, the ransomware report that will come out here in, uh, in about a month is going to be an uh, interesting um, use case where we're moving away from just raw sample sharing and actually doing targeted sample sharing where it's stuff around specific uh, adversaries or specific areas of threat intelligence that we care about. And that's, again, with the goal of providing um, new and interesting reports uh, out there, too. It'll be published under the Cyber Threat Alliance uh, letterhead, so um, nothing specific to each one of the four vendors, but all of them will be talking about the Cyber Threat Launch report. Okay? Um, so we started the malware sharing process with a very crude, um, just a secure FTP sharing. Um, everybody had their own server. Uh, we moved to the Virex Norman sample sharing framework, which is kind of one of the ways the security industry uh, has traditionally shared samples. Um, it's a free open source uh, PHP-based uh, web server, and I'll show you an example of what that looks like here. It's outdated, though. It hasn't been updated in um, almost two or three years. So uh, we've uh, set out to actually change that and move to the CTA Sticks Taxi platform, which uh, 
Stix Taxi. Again, I'll go through a couple slides of what that is, but it's DHS. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about it. It's the DHS um, derived or DHS created inspired um, threat intel sharing platform. It's not actually a platform. It's actually just um, the way they prescribe how you should do uh, sharing. We'll talk about some challenges we've incurred with that as well. Um, now, once we have the platform up and running and we're sharing via Stix Taxi, we're going to break it down a little bit more and go into the Cybox, the specific observables that we care about. I'll talk about what Cybox is here in a second as well. And then lastly, we'll do uh, some SDK support and uh, platform support for various other Stix Taxi platforms that are out there, which includes Soltra that has a, um, for again, Stix Taxi, it's a vendor neutral, um, free community edition Stix Taxi server that's out there. We, we don't use it yet, but we will ensure that we plug into it. So. Uh, one of those things to consider in the future if you're interested in receiving free feeds uh, via Stix Taxi, you could use either build your own Stix Taxi server, download our client server, or you can uh, use other open source platforms that are out there. Okay? So Virex, just a quick overview of how sample sharing works, um, or used to work, uh, which is just every vendor had to create a Virex platform, which is just a um, web server that a, somebody that wanted to share would push their files to it. Um, the server would take the metadata around each uh, file, the hash, the file type, um, just the high level overview of those files. It'll store that in a SQL database and it'll actually store the binary in a network uh, file share. Um, and if you wanted to get something, you'd query that SQL, the web server, it'll do the back end query on uh, MySQL and then pull it from the, the network file share. The problem with this is with peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, any peer-to-peer -peer architecture, it's, uh, it grows exponentially. So with just four members, each one of us having our own server and sharing uh, files, if I want to get the files from Symantec, Intel, and Fortinet, I, that's three different connections I have to do, um, and you know, 1,000 files per minimum um, every day. Now, when we go to 25 SAMP, uh, companies, that becomes very unwieldy. I mean, with four, it was already 12 different connections that had to occur just amongst the four of us. Uh, at, 20, at 25 people, which was what we'll have at the end of the year, it's going to be a crazy amount of uh, connections that need to occur just for one day's uh, sharing. So one of the interesting things about Sticks and Taxi is the support for uh, Taxi specifically is hub-spoke model, which is every individual that's in the sharing uh, community or consortium can just push their information or whatever it is they're interested in sharing to a central hub. Um, they can then subscribe to whatever information they care about, regardless of who submits it, and then pull that down. So instead of the multiple peer-to-peer -peer exponential growth, it's just one connection to the hub that takes care of uh, whatever it is you want to share, both receiving and sending. Okay. So this is uh, where we're at right now. We're actually moving to this um, currently, so that's about 10,000 samples being pushed in by 10 different connections um, per day, and then uh, multiply that out by 10, being uh, 10,000 being downloaded by 10 people, so 100,000 per day being downloaded as well. Okay. The way we're doing that is uh, kind of interesting and relatively low cost and cheap. Um, but one of the things we always talk about first is uh, threat intelligence, which is what is threat intelligence uh, and how we define it here as the Cyber Threat Alliance. Um, it's not just about the raw sample sharing, it's about taking action on that information. The samples that we receive, we try to ensure that we know uh, the context around that sample. Um, where did it come from? Who sent it? Uh, where, um, what, what kind of uh, adversary was associated with? Something that can be actionable to the user. And so the viewpoint here is, and this is where we're trying to move from and to, an IP address is bad, a URL is bad. That doesn't really tell you much other than it's bad. But something like uh, on a given date, a uh, command and control server associated with the netwire rat, the actual payload that's being pushed down to the endpoint, um, being served, uh, being communicating over TCP port 3360, something you can actually look for in your network security stack, uh, and is associated with uh, Nigerian cyber criminals. So something that you can actually take uh, note of. So, and you know, the, the example I would show here is, you know, if you're a, a company that has, or an organization that has a thousand plus uh, sensor hits on your security uh, apparatus a day, it would really help if you knew exactly which 10 would, uh, are the ones you should look at. The example I always go back to is Target. The Target uh, breach that we all know about um, occurred during the middle of their day, occur occurred over two weeks. Their security uh, sensors and their security stack actually detected it. It's not that it, the problem was that the detection uh, didn't just say, hey, all your credit card information is being stolen right now, or this is an advanced threat group coming after you. It was just malware.generic. Um, but it properly did detect. It just said, it just, they couldn't um, 
properly prioritize it in the uh, context of their day-to-day -day -day, um, triage of their security platform. So this is where the actionable part of it comes into. Having that context to know of the thousand sensor hits that you have a day, what 10 or what 100 are the ones that your team should actually be focusing in on? The ones that are actually going to cause you to be on the front page uh, of the news the next day. Um, so that's the mindset that kind of has to change when it comes to threat intelligence sharing. Just sharing data, raw data, um, just block it, it's bad. That's not going to cut it because eventually what's happening here is, remember, the adversaries, the people that you're trying to protect against, they're not going to just give up, oh, they blocked me, too bad, I'll just stop here. These are, in a lot of cases, in crimeware specifically, these are folks, very sh sharp folks, that li live in various places around the world that are looking for jobs. And this is the best job that they could find. They're, they're just trying to find a way to put money on the table to feed their kids. They're not going to stop just because you block one specific IP address or one specific domain name. They're going to evolve, and you need to evolve with them. Your security stack should evolve as well. But at the same time, you need to be, if you have a mature SOC, you should be evolving with the threats, prioritized against the area the, of IP or the area of interest for your organization, what you actually need to protect against. Okay? And that's what the, the final uh, use case I'll show you here in a second. Um, so the intelligence lifecycle and all the reports that you will see um, kind of focuses in on very similar to the DOD uh, Intel uh, doctrine here on uh, intelligence, the intelligence process, which starts with the direction, which is analyze all the data available to us. Um, we have a very robust collection platform, the threat intel sharing platform that we're talking about, uh, processing all of it to pull out only the ones that we care about, um, analyzing it and putting it into context of, hey, we know this is cyber crime coming from Nigeria. This is a uh, SCADA specific group operating out of Zambia. Yeah, This kind of stuff. stuff. Stuff that actually is actionable, that provides context that's useful to the customers and to the threat researchers. At the end of the day, any report that you read, whether it comes from the Cyber Threat Alliance or any other threat intel unit, including Unit 42, um, should help you identify this triangle on the right, which is the resources, motivations, and tactics of the adversary that you're trying to defend against. And if you're going to get into the threat intel sharing game, um, you should care about this triangle. If you don't care about this triangle, then you probably aren't at the stage yet where threat sharing, threat intel sharing will be useful to you um, to the hundredth hundred degree. You know. if, uh, you need to understand the resources that these bad guys are using because when they uh, adapt or uh, morph to the next level, the next iteration, um, Understanding that those resources and what they have available to them understands where they may next pivot to and that you need to be vigilant for. Their motivations, what it is they're coming after. You know, if, if they're just a low-level crimeware or spam bots just trying to get uh, mal, mal, uh, malvertising adware campaigns onto your machines, then you're probably not going to be worried about them if you're trying to protect your point-of-sale networks because they're not going to do that. They're just trying to load malware on uh, adware on your machines, that kind of stuff. So understand what their motivations are, and then finally understand their tactics. The tactics is kind of where we always get bogged down in um, a lot of times when we're looking at SOX and uh, advanced defense. The tactics are usually the, the cyber kill chain, how they're coming in, what IP addresses they're using, what spam emails, that, how they're forming their emails, what... Um, what implants they're using to actually uh, get into your system and uh, be successful. So if you can understand all three of these, you have a very, very good chance of evolving with them as they move, move forward. You have to evolve your defenses with them, and this is the way in which to do it, to understand that. Now, the DHS standard for Stix, Taxi, and Cybox, um, one of the challenges that we've run into here is just like the browser wars of the uh, 90s, where it was Netscape versus Firefox versus Internet Explorer, um, more recently Chrome, Sticks and Taxi, from an understanding perspective, a lot of people say the words, but they don't fully understand what they're saying in, in a lot of cases. Um, they just want Sticks Taxi or Sticks Taxi support. Sticks Taxi is just like HTTP RFCs, uh, request for comments. These are the um, documents that kind of govern how the network world works. Okay, So every time you open up your browser and you go to HTTP colon slash slash something, there's uh, a definition of how the transfers are occurring in the background for that browser to render the website that you're seeing. Okay, um, That's all defined in RFC something for the HTTP. Now, in much the same way, that just says how that transfer should occur of HTML documents. The Stix Taxi Cybox documents are the exact same thing. They very much, they, they just tell you how um, information should be exchanged. They don't tell you how to implement it. They leave that up to the implementer themselves. So 
one of the issues you'll see using various vendors when it comes to Stix Taxi um, platforms is that they're not going to be interoperable. Um, trying to share between a uh, vendor A's uh, Stix Taxi platform to vendor B's Stix Taxi platform to your own homegrown solution, you will occur, incur um, issues in terms of the definitions between uh, the sharing models. So you always have to ensure that before you enter into any sharing agreement with anyone um, and into that infrastructure, that you understand how they are using Sticks and Taxi specifically, how they're actually defining every individual thing um, in their threat stack. Because if you don't have the same definitions, you're not, the, the sharing of the information won't make sense. Okay? Um, I'll show you a breakdown of what this looks like here in a second. Uh, taxi is the lowest level. It's how messages should be exchanged and it just subscribe it just prescribes how you should share those messages. Sticks is the structured threat information um, exchange and that is a XML document that describes a whole bunch of fields on how you can describe an adversary, the tactics, the techniques, and the procedures, that triangle from the previous slide. The cyber observables, which is finally, it's, an, it's all just one big nest, so cyber observables are what you can actually observe on the, on the wire, okay? The actual IPS signatures that you'll see, the actual sample hashes that you'll see, the emails, um, the, the signatures or the, the actual thumbprints that you'll use to identify a group or an individual. Um, Sticks is how you again put them all, package them into a threat actor group, and Taxi is how you actually send them to someone else. Okay, um, so this is an example of it. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, here is an example of expressing relationships in Sticks. This is from DHS uh, MITRE. Um, the red here is an associated actor, so this is a Sticks object. Um, this associated actor has a couple of different TTPs that you can observe. Um, and that's in purple here. The initial compromise vector, um, how they establish a foothold in your network, how they escalate privileges to move about your network, um, how they do internal reconnaissance inside your network. All of these are, the way in which somebody does this is uh, indicative of who they are or helps you kind of categorize or bin them into that threat actor group, those tactics, techniques, and procedures. So these are all sticks XML um, entries that have nested within them the yellow and blue things right here, uh, cyber observables. These are things you can actually see from your, uh, your, your various vendor platforms, security platforms. And this includes like the spear phishing email that's being used. That is a cyber observable. The actual uh, sample hash, the MD5 SHA-256 of the exploit or the uh, payload that's actually being downloaded to your machines. That is an example of a cyber observable. So you nest cyber observables inside of the sticks uh, tactics and techniques and procedures, which then you share to other groups or organizations via taxi, okay? So all very high level. Again, this is where it's very important to understand what does established foothold mean to you versus the information source you're receiving it from? What is um, a escalating privilege? What does that mean to you? What is a sample? Um, you know, what, is it, what, what actually counts as a sample? Are you talking about the uh, the first sample that comes, comes down to do the initial exploit, or are you talking about the payload that's downloaded later on? What are you referencing when you're talking about each one of these definitions? One of the hard parts that we've kind of encountered as we've started to bring in more and more folks is various people have very uh, subtle but distinct differences in the way they define these things. Um, and that makes all the difference. So if you think a piece of malware, Organization A thinks a piece of malware includes the initial um, downloader, Whereas um, uh, group B thinks that the only malware counts is the malware that's actually doing the exploits, um, or finally the actual payload that's coming in. Three different areas of the kill chain that all have a sample hash associated with them. If you're defining a dropper and the receiving end thinks that you're defining a actual uh, payload, then you're talking about two different things that are very, very different in the cyber kill chain and very different in terms of how you would categorize and respond to that adversary. So it's very, very important. It's just a huge lesson learned. Um, before you ever enter into any information sharing agreement with Sticks and Taxi, ensure that you first define how you view every single one of these uh, fields and how you would use them within your enterprise. Okay? Um, this is just a very high level uh, overview of the XML breakdown. And this is what Sticks Taxi looks like. It's not pretty. It's literally just machine to machine talking to each other. Um, on a regular basis, very rapid, very quick, um, so that humans don't really have to interact with them unless they want to. But the human interaction is where the actual rubber meets the road. That's where you actually have to make sense of this data, the data that you're receiving, um, and apply it to what is most uh, dear to your organization from a protection standpoint.
Now, the thing I wanted to share with this group as well is just how cheap this, poss this, this happens. Um, everything on the CTA platform that we have right now is, actually, I'll go back one slide. It's all uh, free. So we created this using, and this is all stuff that we can provide. Uh, just let me know if you're interested. I can share with you the scripts that were used to do this. Um, but we all use at the bottom right there. It's all just Ubuntu Server 14.04 um, with Sticks and Taxi versions 1.1, which is uh, released by DHS, their Python libraries. Um, the web server is Nginx with uh, G-Unicorn, both open source. Um, and we use Python 2.7 to uh, run the web services. Um, we have everything load balanced, um, and this is, again, 100,000 plus uh, downloads a day, 10,000 plus up. Um, it load balances very quickly and easily on Amazon EC2 um, and using free or micro instances um, for very, very cheap. So when it's not being used, it's not costing us much. And when it is being used, it's only for the time that it's actually doing those transactions that uh, it occurs. So it's about 40 bucks a day, maybe even less, um, for the scale in which we're doing it. Much sm smaller scales, you can go down all the way to about five bucks a day, maybe even cheaper with this uh, implementation. And all it is is the exact same thing I showed you from the Virex platform earlier, which is um, a load balancer that takes uh, the servers here, it takes in the request, the taxi request, it strips it, it puts the metadata into a MySQL database that's hosted by Amazon as well, and the actual binary to an Amazon S3 store to actually store the, the data. All this is highly scriptable, very easy to do. Um, and again, we have the scripts. If you're interested, talk to me afterwards. I can share with, I can get those to you here in a few weeks, okay? Um, so it was very interesting, the, Next step of so what? You have this data, but what are you going to use it for, right? Um, one of the interesting things that we found uh, within, and this is now Unit 42 talking, uh, CRITS, another open source tool, very, it's free and available from DHS MITRE, um, is a really interesting way for, it's a, think of it as SharePoint for uh, threat, threat analysts and threat researchers, okay? Um, it's a great way to kind of Take, make sense of all this threat data that you're receiving on a regular basis, whether, whether it's from your sensors, whether you manually upload it, or you're sharing it via Sticks Taxi. Um, this is just an example of some of the stuff uh, that, they, that you can look at. On the left side, you can see um, the, everything gets categorized and binned. Uh, it's a Mongo database on the back end. Uh, but you can categorize everything by actors, campaigns, unique certificates that are associated with uh, connections and or malware. Um, the domains they're coming from, email addresses, events, indicators, IP addresses. These are all various uh, cyber observables that we talked about in the previous slide um, that are all automatically categorized and indexed and linked for you via CRITS. Um, on the right-hand side is what the actual uh, home page looks like. You can kind of split it up by different areas. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of hard to see. Well, you can see that there. Netwire, Dark Comet, PlugX. And you can see how many emails you have uh, stored, indicators, uh, samples, domains, IP addresses. It categorizes all of those for you, and then you can then link them and search uh, by section to see whether or not um, to build out your campaign. I'll show you how we use this to actually identify a really interesting uh, group that was targeting um, governments in the ASEAN region. The other interesting part of CRITS was the ability to expand on that threat data. So what it does, you upload a sample to CRITS, it's not just that one sample or the information that you received. You can actually do plugins to do a lot more with that sample that automatically happens once you upload that sample. Um, you can tie it in with uh, Cuckoo, an open source sandbox, uh, OpenDNS, which provides uh, free um, uh, API access, passive total, PE info, um, SSD, and a few other interesting things, UPX, which is a free unpacker tool. What happens is every time you open, uh, upload a sample or something related to an IP address or something related to one of these interesting plugins, it, CRITS will identify it, and then we'll go out and query any of these open source uh, tools um, against that and put that data back into CRITS for you to very quickly see. So if it's a sample you don't know what it's, if it's a, a packed sample, you're not sure what the packer is, you upload it to CRITS, CRITS will run UPX on it in the background, and without the researcher having to do anything, it will very quickly be tagged as, you know, um, uh, Armadillo or one of the other uh, UPX uh, packers or packers uh, for that sample. All right? So just a really interesting automation to help with the threat research. Uh, this is an interesting use case uh, for automation that we did with CRITS. Um, and so what we have is we, uh, on VirusTotal, we do uh, Yara hunts. Um, we have a lot of interesting signatures for various groups. Um, again, this is some open, a lot of good open source information out here. Um, I highly recommend you check out um, 
a few different blogs. Uh, again, get with me afterwards. I'll share those with you. But what we do is we look at the Yara signatures. Uh, we hunt for them in VirusTotal. Anytime we see something matching a Yara signature for a known adversary group that we care about tracking, uh, we download that sample from VirusTotal. We push it to uh, our so, well, this is now Cyber Threat Alliance uh, platform to see if anybody else has shared that information and what metadata is associated with that. We pull that into crits all for uh, the ability to sample and link automatically so that we can build out a larger picture of that adversary uh, threat profile, okay? the infrastructure that they're using. Um, and that is what I'm going to show you here in this last, uh, just last few slides here. This is a Unit 42 paper, um, and the Cyber Threat Alliance one that will be released here will be very similar, but uh, actually a lot more comprehensive. Uh, oops. This is uh, Operation Lotus Blossom. For Unit 42, all of the stuff that we do, very similar to the Cyber Threat Alliance, uh, it's all available um, on our blogs uh, for free. We don't sell anything. Unit 42 will never sell anything. Um, our job is just to find cool stuff um, in, with the bad guys and talk about it. So it's a pretty cool job. Um, so check out the blog. Uh, also, the Cyber Threat Alliance is available at cyberthreatalliance.org. Um, so Operation Lotus Blossom was a very interesting um, campaign that we, we noticed at Unit 42, which was a three-plus year campaign that was targeting only government and military sites within uh, customers within the uh, ASEAN region, the Pacific Rim. Um, it, we don't know exactly who the adversary was, but we can identify them based on their tactics, techniques, and procedures. That triangle we talked about earlier, the resources, their motivations, um, and how they're going about their attacks. So. What was interesting is just uh, how we can source this data and how the importance of threat intelligence sharing and where that came from. This attack data started from Palo Alto Networks data, our sandboxing platform, our 6,000 clients worldwide about a year and a half ago. Um, we took that data and we noticed something was unique about it. It was very targeted. We only saw it in a certain region affecting a certain clientele. So we combined that with uh, data from the Cyber Threat Alliance and a few other uh, open source uh, places um, and used that to help expand the picture. And there's one slide on here that's actually really, really cool. Um, but not this one. <laughs> the next slide, uh, I think, is actually the cool one. So what we did was we found exactly their tactics, techniques, procedures. What was the spear phishing email that they were using? What was the attachment with it? Um, what, specific, what was unique about that attachment? And why were we not seeing it anywhere else? More importantly, what was the back door that they were using? Because it was unique. And it was custom coded just for this operation. So whatever it was. Regardless of how the spear phishing email, and it changed by country, by language type, um, it was very similarly worded, but always unique to that geographic location, um, and very similar in the email campaign. But at the end of the day, the exploit document, whatever it was, always led to the exact same back door. Okay? And so again, this is understanding which element of the kill chain you're talking about when you're doing your threat intelligence research and you're sharing. Um, this was the uh, target set that was uh, being, that was being affected by this uh, backdoor. More importantly was the architecture that we're able to summarize from this. And this is where, it's very important, this is where threat intelligence, if you have a mature SOC or a research group that can get to this level of understanding. Um, and again, don't do it on, all on your own, but pull this in. This is all data that we started with, just what we had our sensor data, and we blew it up big time by sharing it, uh, pulling it in from other sources, open, majority of it being open sources. Um, you can see here the various colors, uh, Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Indonesia. The inf this is all the infrastructure associated with the uh, adversary. And this is all, again, going back to the uh, sticks uh, observables associated with this uh, adversary. What you notice is what was interesting and in how you can link a lot of this, they are humans at the end of the day. They're going to do their, uh, their tactics, their techniques, their resources. Um, as best as they possibly can. And in some cases, they'll make human mistakes. One of those was they connected, um, they registered their domains with using the exact same email address. So that was just an interesting observable that you can find. And this is not something that you're going to get on your products, on any of your security, uh, your, you know, your perimeter uh, <laughs> firewalls or antiviruses or anything like that. This is other intel that you have to actually bring in to kind of add to the data that you have in order to kind of get that bigger picture. Um, more importantly, they also had, uh, they made some mistakes and they had overlapping infrastructure. So between Hong Kong and Taiwan and Vietnam, between the Philippines and Hong Kong, and then between Indonesia and Hong Kong. 
um, we were able to kind of hop around along with them, and their mistakes ended up becoming uh, clues for us. The only way you can get this information, though, is by expanding our aperture, and then again, narrowing it down to the links that are specific and to, unique to these individuals. Now, in so doing, we now know that all of these cyber observables associated um, that you see on this graph, which is quite a lot, um, they all become indicators uh, associated with this specific organization, or these, this adversary. So if you're a government organization or public sector organization located in this area, these should be at the very top of your 1,000 plus sensor hits a day. Um, those that are generic but come from or have any relations to these uh, observables should be at the top of your list because we know the motivation of this adversary is against government uh, organizations. All right? So it's just the use case of where we should uh, ideally head with the uh, advanced security and threat sharing. All right? um, with that, uh, leave, uh, leave it open for any questions. Other than that, thanks for your time. Any questions? Sweet. All right. Thank you, guys.